This is Talking Drupal, a weekly chat about web design and development from a group of people with one thing in common. We love Drupal. This is episode 320, Drupal 8, End of Life. Welcome to Talking Drupal. Today we're talking about Drupal 8, End of Life with Gabor Hoichi. Gabor is an avid open source enthusiast and contributor. He is the Drupal 10 Initiative Coordinator, Drupal Core Product Manager, and Initiative Coordinator, working with and on the open source project itself at Acquia. He is a regular Drupal event speaker and organizer and does communication and social media for various initiatives. He used to be the Drupal 8 Multilingual Initiative Lead and the former release manager for Drupal 6, and he's approaching 10 thousand commits on drupal.org. Gabor, welcome to the show and thank you for joining us. I'm Nick Laughlin and today my co-hosts are, as usual, John Picozzi. What's new with you this week? Um, well, it is um, November. Well, it's, it is Drupal end of life. It is November 2nd, but um, we are just about two weeks away from the New England Drupal camp. So uh, we are going to be ramping up well, we've been ramping up, but we will, are going to be ramping up to the, the finale for this year, which is going to be uh, BOFCON on November uh, 19th, um, virtually online. So you can join from anywhere. Um, so we will be uh, feverishly working over the next two weeks to make sure that event goes perfectly. And um, if you are interested in tickets or learning more, you can go to nedcamp.org. Joining us for the second week in a row and for the next two weeks as well as April was new with you this week. Um, thanks. Uh, yeah, so a few weeks ago, I actually was reached out uh, from our camp venue for Drupal Camp Asheville about, are we going to do our camp in person next summer? And I was like, what? In person planning? Um, so last week, I met with someone on campus. It's a UNC Asheville uh, checking out a different area of campus and uh starting starting that that uh planning so that's pretty exciting it feels, ready to get back to in person feels a little early right like when when is uh drupal camp Asheville typically it's uh this, usually the second week of july okay um we want to make sure we secure a venue for sure and we right. typically start our planning in january but yeah i wasn't even on my radar and it was like oh, in person what <laughs> Yeah, we, we went through that again this year. We we thought we'd be in person, you know, with vaccinations rolling out and stuff. And then about two months ago, we saw the numbers and said, you know what, let's uh, let's go virtual again this year. Uh, so we, we went through that process. 2022 is going to be rocking. A lot of events indeed. Yep. And uh, also joining us to talk about end of life is Gabor, what's new with you this week? Yeah, hi. Um, so I've been thinking of all of the Drupal versions, basically all the Drupal core versions recently. We are having meetings at Acquia about uh, better defining and pinning down our Drupal 7 um, extended support commitments. I'm committing some PHP 8 compatibility issues to my Drupal 7 contrib modules, oh, wow. which is crazy. Um, I'm, I've been blogging about the Drupal 7 EOL the past seven days. I had a blog post a day about different aspects of the Drupal 8 EOL. Uh, the Drupal 9.3 release is being prepared. So I'm, as part of the committer team, I, I was working on helping prepare that as well. And we are looking at uh, Drupal 10 next year. So looking at getting all of the pieces in for Drupal 10 into 9.3 and 9.4. Okay. So really looking at all the things all at once is uh, interesting. That's a real high level bird's eye view type, <laughs> type uh, perspective. Yeah. Uh, so for, for myself, just a couple of quick things. I, uh, I'm back from vacation. Uh, so I'll let John know that I did not work last week, actually. I, I think I spent one hour total because, you know, it's the end of the month, I have to send out invoices. But you know, it was just, uh, just about an hour's worth of work. Other than that, I just kind of stayed away and it was fabulous. You know, it was great to, to finally have a chance to kind of relax and decompress. Um, in other news, we actually went to Salem again this year. Uh, so we, we skipped it last year, but Salem is a, a famous town in Massachusetts. Uh, it's famous for having the witch trials in, I think, the 1600s. Um, 
I should actually know that. <laughs> um, but because of that, it's actually a pretty, a pretty big Halloween hotspot. So um, it's outdoors. So um, we felt it was uh, an okay idea. And when it got a little crowded, we put on our masks, but it's always nice because people uh, put together a ton of costumes and it's fun to see people out and about. Uh, and so we, we went there this year for a couple hours and my wife made our costumes. We were Jasmine and the magic flying carpet. Uh, so it was, it was a lot of fun. So we've got a new module this week. The module of the week is views Ajax history. Yeah. So, uh, again, my last week's update said I was working on my personal website, um, was working in a view for a blog and was using, um, better exposed filters to have a filter block on the side. You click the filter, the block updates because it's using Ajax. Nice, everything looks good. But then I realized, hey, wait a second. I don't really have a way to link to the filtered page if I, for some reason, needed to do that. Well, here comes Views Ajax History. Uh, installing this module, uh, you uh, are given an option in your Ajax settings on your view to um, basically allow this module to update your URL string with a query parameter for that filter. So that way you can, um, you can link to the page. Uh, you may also get some SEO benefits. I'm not an SEO whiz kid, but <clears throat> I imagine being able to, uh, to go directly to that term page could be, could be useful for you. So uh, pretty, pretty straightforward, simple module, but, uh, works really great and, um, was, was easy to, uh, to install and get up and running. Sounds good. So let's move on to our primary topic this week. So let's start with an easy question. Uh, what does it mean to be end of life? So for Drupal 8, um, that means that they will not release any more security or bug fix versions of Drupal 8 anymore. We, um, we've only been supporting Drupal 8 for security fixes at this point anyway. So that's not gonna happen anymore. So if you need to have security fixes for your websites, you need to move to Drupal 9 as soon as possible. So now the end of life is here. Uh, are there stats on how many websites need to be upgraded? That's a really interesting question because there's a central place that tracks Drupal core usage. So if you go to drupal.org slash project slash usage slash Drupal, that will tell you about Drupal core usage stats. Um, there's a lot of discussion whether or how much, um, how much we can depend on that data because more and more people use uh, Composer to set up their sites, the less people use update uh, module in Drupal core, which, uh, which provides this data for Drupal.org. So it may or may not be data that we can rely on. Uh, this data shows that there's uh, more than 200,000 Drupal 8 sites that still need to up update. So there's a lot of sites that, um, that, um, that where the update is still ahead of them. So if people are using Composer, is there a way for us to get, in the future, get statistics on usage from there, just for the number of installs that are happening? Yeah, there's an experimental solution, I think, on Drupal.org that tracks uh, the Composer downloads as well, but it's not currently factored into this because there is a different lens into how this data is calculated. So we would need to have that exposed somehow as well. Interesting. Right, because that wouldn't necessarily be unique downloads, right? So it would just be, mm -hmm. it'd be like, yep. hey, you you installed your project on a server five million times. There you go. Yep. Yep. Um, so uh, Drupal 7, uh, sorry, Drupal 8, obviously, end of life today. We've already covered that. Drupal 7, though, is not end of life until next year. Um, why is that? Why is Drupal 8 end of life now and Drupal 7 gets another another year to, to live vicariously through everybody. Yeah, there's, so they are, they were originally scheduled to be end of life at the same time. The, for Drupal 8, we have kind of an external, uh, external constraint for end of life in Drupal 8, because as we developed Drupal 8, we built in a lot of third-party 
components that we, we used a lot of third party components to build Drupal 8. And that helped us that in a way that we didn't need to reinvent the wheel in a lot of ways. We don't need to implement our own HTTP um, query handler. We didn't need to reinvent our own container system, our own plugin system, et cetera. And uh, where our own plugin system we built, but we used a lot of components from other systems. And that meant that we can rely on these pro uh, projects. We can also contribute to them. So we contributed and improved a lot of these projects throughout the years. But it also meant that we need to uh, synchronize with the release schedules. So for Drupal 8, um, we need to look at the Symfony uh, 4 end of life. And that happens uh, right now in November, 2021. And we don't own Symfony, so we can't release further releases of Symfony 4 once it's end of life. So we need to end of life Drupal 8. Uh, the same thing for Drupal 7 though, it has some uh, third party components that we use uh, like jQuery uh, that we use there, but they don't have um, a pressure of end of life in Drupal 7 uh, immediately. So it's more of our own code, more of our own making. And so we have our own uh, decision there when to end of life Drupal 7. We've extended that timeline. It's not this time because of all of the, all of the financial problems and struggles that COVID put on companies and people. At this time, it was uh, hard to say that when you need to let go of people because you don't have the money anymore to maintain your university site, then, uh, then you wouldn't. It wouldn't be fair to require you to move off of Drupal seven right away. And I think that makes sense. So uh, one of the things that always comes up when a piece of software is coming to end of life is, does that mean that the software is not going to work any longer? Uh, you know, if my site isn't upgraded today, is my site going to shut down? Yeah, Drupal eight. There's no like built-in licensing scheme that 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 stops your site from working when you when your license key expires. There's not going to be a banner at the top of the page that you're running an insecure site. Uh, in fact, um, there's no there's no uh, guarantees that on day one it's uh, your site is going to be insecure. What happens is that the Drupal security team and the Drupal core maintainers will not release further security updates for Drupal eight. So your Drupal 8 site may become insecure if there is a security fix that could have been released for Drupal 8 that maybe applies to Drupal 9 or it doesn't apply to Drupal 9 but could have um, been applied to Drupal 8, then uh, your website will become insecure. And even then it's a, it's a balancing act. I think even for regular security updates for your site, you weight the pros and cons of making a release of your website based on whether the security problem affects your site's um, inner workings or not. Uh, so the same applies now, except there will be no central guidance as to whether there is even a security problem or how serious it is. Aside from the security updates, right? So you're not getting those anymore. I mean, essentially modules could stop working as well, right? If if those modules start to update to for newer versions of Drupal, is there is there a risk there? I mean, obviously if you have a set of modules that's working, like they should continue to work, but if you were to start updating those modules, you may run into issues, is that true? Yeah, you don't need to update your modules. So if you have a working site, you can st still keep using your working site. If the modules uh, keep updating, they may become incompatible with Drupal 8. If you change your uh, platform, if you update your PHP version to PHP 8 or PHP 8.1, that's gonna be a problem for Drupal 8. Um, so yeah, so if you change the constraints of the site, then, then you may run into a problem. This end of life also though applies as a policy to contrib modules too, right? I think that might be part of John's point too. So like. If a module is only in Drupal 8 and not a Drupal 8 and 9 hybrid module, the security team is no longer going to review that module, correct? Yeah, the yes, the Drupal Association is going to mass mark uh, Drupal uh, releases that are only compatible with Drupal 8 and not compatible with uh, Drupal 9 as unsupported. Okay. Yeah, I think that might be a, a big factor too for some people yep. to consider. Yeah, so, so what can people do if they want to continue using Drupal 8? 
So they don't need to do anything. They can still keep using Drupal 8 uh, as it is. Uh, they need to uh, make sure that the environment that they're running it in stays relatively the same. Uh, as I said, like one of the things that we uh, that we did for Drupal 9 is we made it compatible with PHP 8, but that couldn't happen for Drupal 8 because it would require some backwards compatibility breaks. So uh, if you update your environment to PHP 8, it's not going to work uh, with Drupal 8 anymore. So as long as you can reasonably uh, keep your environment and your site the same code base with the same environment, it will run fine. Uh, and you need to consider any potential security risks in the future that could affect your site. Uh, so I would suggest you try to look at uh, updating from Drupal 8. It's much easier than any previous version to update from Drupal 8. So we talked about um, why Drupal 8's end of life and needing to keep up with other other um, softwares that we're using, um, you know, keeping up with their release schedules. Uh, thinking of that, do you think the new release and end of life schedule for Drupal um, will keep uh, will help to keep um, improving the platform, moving the platform forward? Yeah, I think so. Uh, that, so what, what we decided with uh, this continuous upgrade process is that we are adding new APIs to Drupal core as we go. So when we built Drupal 9, we built that in Drupal 8. We've added the new APIs into Drupal 8. And then the Drupal 9 release was basically removing the old deprecated APIs that we decided to remove. And we kept the new things so that we could, this way we could build a transition from Drupal 8 to Drupal 9. And we're doing the same from 9 to 10. We are putting in all the new APIs to 9, all the new functionality to 9 that we want to have in 10. And the 10 is basically removing old craft, old craft that we don't want to see anymore. So one of the things, for example, is uh, the Olivero theme that's being built for Drupal core. We are at, we've added it to Drupal 9. Uh, we are planning to stabilize it very soon. It's very close to being stable now. And we hope to make it the default theme in Drupal 10 and remove the Bartik theme in Drupal 10. So it's basically a transition of adding the new things in a major version and removing the old things in the next major version and thus cleaning up and modernizing the platform gradually as we go. So we're gonna go down a rabbit hole right here because you just you just said something that's interesting to me. So um, enabling Olivero as the default theme, great. Removing Bartik also could be considered great, but what does that upgrade look like for from from like where you're sitting right so as a as somebody who might be using bartik right like now i'm thinking okay i have to like in, install the upgrade and then put all my blocks back into the site in some way shape or form uh, are you guys thinking of a way to make that migration smoother or is it kind of just like that's the way it is yeah, all all the all of the these components that we remo remove from core, like Bartik, and there's a, a few a few more that we plan to remove from Drupal nine to ten. Um, are we are making them contributed projects, so you can install the contributed project uh, alongside the new major version and keep using the theme or the module that you used before, and then it's up to the country maintainer to keep supporting it uh, or okay. not in the future. That Perfect. makes sense. So I, I kind of want to reinforce one of the points you made that I, I feel like the Drupal 8 to Drupal 9 upgrade path, up, update process has been the smoothest major version upgrade process in history for Drupal. Um, and I know a lot of effort went into doing it the way that you said, where you added the APIs in Drupal 8 for Drupal 9, and then got it to a point where going from the actual Drupal 8 version to Drupal 9 upgrade was just swapping out Symphony and removing deprecated code, right? Yeah. Now I imagine that there's a lot of work under the hood to make sure that it works in it. As a core committer, I'm curious about if you were involved in that particular aspect and if you were, how does that, how, how did that process go and how did you make sure other than, you know, the Drupal tests, how did you ensure that, um, you were actually only changing those things because Drupal is a very large and complex code base. Um, yeah, yeah. Now this is a rabbit hole. 
So <laughs> this is like, it could be an yep. hour. This topic could be an hour. So, um, so we have various ways where that we mark deprecated code. We add an annotation, mm -hmm. add deprecated to the deprecated parts of the code. Mm -hmm. And we also add an active trigger error that triggers when you call the deprecated APIs. And, mm -hmm. that, and that's activated in tests. So in test runs, you get, a, you get a fail when you try to use deprecated APIs in Drupal core. So when we add new code and it tries to use a deprecated API, it will fail. So we can only add new code if it's not using deprecated APIs. So that's how we ensure in Drupal core that we keep not using deprecated APIs is we okay. actively fail in our tests. And we, we built a lot of tooling around this. So um, uh, Matt Glemon uh, at Centaro originally built a tool mm -hmm. uh, on top of PHP 10 that allows us to scan all, all of the contributed projects and your custom code for uses mm -hmm. of deprecated APIs. And that was originally called PHP 10 Drupal. And then a runner on top of that was made called Drupal Check. And then a Drupal UI on top of that was made called Upgrade Status. And then Upgrade Status extended the functionality tremendously. So it checks all of your code, all of your projects for deprecated API use. It checks whether updates are available to those projects that already fix those issues. Um, and then it checks your environment if it's compatible with Drupal 9 in this case. So Upgrade Status is basically a very comprehensive tool that you install. It will tell you if you are using any of the APIs that are removed in Drupal 9, if you can update any of the modules that are compatible with Drupal 9. And then we ran upgrade status on all of the contributed projects, so more than 10,000 contributed projects. And we actually run it every week still. We run upgrade status every week on all of the contributed projects. And we have a huge uh, report on the on the compatibility and status of all of the contributed projects and their compatibility with Drupal 9. So this runs on the Drupal Association infrastructure. And then uh, Acquia built a tool on top of this. It's uh, visible on dev.acquia.com. On the Drupal 9 menu, you can see the status of all of the contributed projects. Mm -hmm. And so we've had detailed data about which deprecated APIs are used widely, which are used less. And then uh, Palantir.net came in and they sponsored work on building automated fixes for these deprecated APIs. So they built a Drupal Rector and then worked with the community to expand the Rector rules is what we call them to have automated fixes for these deprecated APIs so that you can run this tool on your code and it will automatically fix a lot of your deprecated APIs. I think it's 60% of your Drupal 8, of all of the country of deprecated APIs have coverage with automation to fix them with Drupal Rector. So basically you install upgrade status. It helps you keep your modules up to date. It tells you which APIs are you using that are deprecated. And then it helps you to run Drupal Rector. It tells you which ones are covered by Drupal Rector. And then you can go run Drupal Rector, fix most of them. And then some of the ones that are left, it tells you, leads you to the documentation of how you can fix those deprecated APIs. And then you can make them Drupal 9 compatible. And I think the final piece of the puzzle is that we made extensions capable of being compatible with both Drupal 8 and 9 at the same time. So you can have a module that is could be installed on Drupal 8 and 9 at the same time. Mm -hmm. So basically your update involves updating Drupal core and then updating all of the component, uh, well, updating Drupal core to Drupal 8.9, so the latest Drupal 8 version. Yep. Uh, then updating all of your components to be Drupal 9 compatible as well as Drupal 8 compatible. And then the final thing, the actual update to Drupal 9 is only involves updating Drupal core. So you can have a working Drupal 8 site all along. It will always work. It will have the components that are gradually more and more compatible with Drupal 9. And when all of the components are Drupal 9 compatible, then you're ready with updating to Drupal 9. So we built the tools, we made the processes to support multi-core compatibility 
We ran the tools on all of Contrib to inform us on how to best prioritize the automations. Then uh, the automations were built with Palantir.net and the community. And uh, uh, one more thing is that we built the project update bot that runs on Drupal.org that runs these automations on all of the Contrib projects and posts them as patches to the country projects. So it pushed the fixes to country projects like, hey, here's all the fixes that you can make for Drupal 9 compatibility. You don't need humans to figure all these things out because we have this bot that runs you all of these automated fixes. And if it identifies no more deprecated API use, it will also make your multi-core compatibility change in your info file. So that it marks mm -hmm. you as compatible with eight and nine. So you only need to commit that fix and then you're done and then make a release of the project. And then you have a Drupal 9 compatible release. So we built the process, the tooling, we ran it on all of Contrib, we built the bot and then, um, and then uh, we made this available for the community to run. So I think there's never been so much automation and support before for upgrading Drupal uh, major versions. I think it's an it's an overstatement though that it's never been this easy. I think the last Dries note at uh, DrupalCon Europe uh, a month ago, Dries had this light up that it's the easiest upgrade, and then there was a subtext that said uh, critics say Drupal two to three was easier. <laughs> so I'm mean, yes, that is the easiest time. one I've easiest <laughs> one I've been involved in in the last decade. Let's let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, yep. Yep. I, I, I have to say, I agree with all those points. I think there was one other thing that actually came up about, there were two other things that came up about a month ago that actually helped as well. That I'd like to point out for our listeners. One is, I think I think Mixologic has pointed in this, but correct me if I'm wrong. Um, he worked on the lenient endpoint so that, um, because at its root, you can't install a Drupal 8 module that uses a patch to make it Drupal 9 compatible. Um, so there's a lot of hoops you'd have to jump through there, but I think the lenient endpoint fixes that. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Yeah. So that, so this problem is basically, so we have this bot that posts patches to projects, but we still need humans to commit the patches and make the release. And we even need humans to test the patches because a lot of the country projects don't have tests to make sure that the patches are good enough. We think they are good enough. The machines generated them so hopefully yep. they are good enough but we never know they may not be good enough so we need uh humans to verify them and uh as we found uh generally i mean if you look at Dries has this blog post about who sponsors drupal development and it has a data point that about four thousand projects are being worked on every year on drupal.org and there's a lot more projects on drupal.org there's more than ten thousand that are compatible with drupal 8 so half of the projects that are Drupal 8 compatible, the maintainers don't look at them for a year or more. Yep. Um, and I don't think that's a problem necessarily. I think it's great that they contributed those projects. It's great that people are using them. Um, um, so we need a system of taking over maintainership of those projects when somebody decides to move on and they don't want to work on them anymore. I think it's great that people yep. move on and do other things that that excites them. Um, so we don't we don't have a good process for that yet. So one of the things that we were experimenting with is committing these automated bot patches to projects. But that raised a lot of questions like how do we commit them automatically and make releases and how does that uh, intrude on maintainership uh, uh, rights, et cetera. And what happens to security coverage if we commit a patch that may not even work? And what if there's other changes on the branch and should we make a different branch? There's a lot of problems that that raised. So what we decided to do instead is to make this lenient composer facade available to everyone, which basically ignores Drupal core compatibility. So you can install all of the country projects um, if you use this lenient composer facade as well as the base composer facade from Drupal.org. The lenient facade only contains projects that are not Drupal 9 compatible, but Composer 2 has this priority system where it can use multiple facades and then it takes the project from whichever facade, uh, uh, the highest priority facade if it's available there. So if you set it up that way as per the documentation on Drupal.org, then 
you can get the project even if it's not compatible and then you can patch it locally with composer patches or use the backward compatibility project which swaps the info file information runtime and makes it compatible there and that allows you to run them and this applies to any project that is not yet compatible yep. and then we made one more thing uh, a maintainer adoption drive i guess is that two weeks before drupalcon we automatically submitted issues against all of the incompatible projects on drupal.org and told them that if um, that now they have time to respond to this if they st are still interested in maintaining their projects and uh, if they don't then people can take over from there and there is the official takeover uh, process for modules is if you have this issue and the maintainer doesn't respond in two weeks and you can move this issue to the project maintainership queue and then the people will review our, your request for maintainership there and you may gain maintainership of projects that are otherwise unmaintained so now we have somewhat of an accelerated process for taking over those projects as well um, so that more new, new owners can be identified for projects that are still useful that adoption drive was actually the second point I was going to bring up. So I'm glad, I'm glad you ended up there. So, and, and the reason why I know about it is because one of the projects that I wrote for a client and contributed back, I got a, I got an issue on it, uh, which never happens because it's only used on one site at the moment. Uh, it's for, I think it's paragraph forms block. So it allows you to ex basically put a paragraph form in a block and then put it in a layout. Um, so mm -hmm. you can fill out the paragraph without having to edit a, a node or some other entity. Um, so we were kind of using paragraphs in a unique way on the site, um, just kind of like isolated snippets of information. Um, and we didn't have to want to have to deal with like everything that comes around an ent uh, a node. Um, so, so yeah, I think, I think that adoption drive was the way you guys handled it was great as well, because it. Like I said, I got an issue. I said, hey, are you still maintaining this? Do you want to make it Drupal 9 compatible? And it was on my list because I had to update that client site anyway. Um, but you know, it certainly prompted me to update that sooner. Um, I did leave it open for other maintainers because if somebody wants to contribute, I'm open to that. But um, but I did commit that patch and, and make it Drupal 9 compatible. Uh, so, so kind of exiting this rabbit hole, uh, getting back to the show notes. Um, with all that said, like I said, I think I think end of life for Drupal 8 was handled exceedingly well. I mean, we had, what, 18 months, two years of notice maybe of when it was going to happen. Um, and it was made in such a way where, like we've said several times this um, podcast already, basically just removing deprecated code and swapping out Symphony. So, you know, there were certainly some hiccups in some cases, but in general, it was a very straightforward process. Um, that being said, there's still always lessons to be learned. Uh, so I'm curious, what, what lessons have you learned this time around um, going from the Drupal 8 end of life process? What, what will you guys do for Drupal 9 differently? Yeah, so we built out many of these processes and tools as we went. Um, so now that we have the tools in place, I think uh, people can rely on them much sooner. So one of the things that we did is, um, is we started running the Drupal 10 compatibility runs on a Drupal 9 compatible projects, um, I think a couple months ago. Um, and we started identifying which, uh, which of the APIs are not, uh, not yet uh, covered in automation. And then Palantir.net started working on covering those with automations already. And I think the automations for nine to 10 uh, for the Drupal core deprecated APIs are above 90% now. So it's much better oh, coverage. Wow. It's much better coverage than it was for eight to nine. So the nine to 10 is even better automated. And, um, and we're looking at the, the auxiliary uh, APIs like Symphony and Twig. And those have Rector automations uh, from the community other than us, so from third-party communities. Okay. So we can pull those in and run them as well. And then we could have the, uh, the bot running sooner and submit these patches sooner for projects as they can uh, update to Drupal 10. Um, another thing that may be different from uh, 9 to 10 as it was for 8 to 9 
is for Drupal 10, we will require at least uh, PHP 8, maybe PHP 8.1, but likely PHP 8.0 at least. And those, uh, and that requires code changes as well in contributed projects. Uh, as I said at the start, I'm even getting issues for my Drupal 7 projects to be PHP 8 compatible. Uh, uh, so that's uh, interesting. And um, so uh, Matt Glamman is also working on making PHP 8 uh, transformations work with PHP 10 so we can have automated code change suggestions for PHP 8 compatibility for contributed projects, which now that Drupal 8 is end of life and Drupal 8 did not support PHP 8, uh, we can run those PHP 8 compatibility patches for uh, contrib and we can make them compatible right now. We don't need to wait for Drupal 10 because Drupal 9 supports PHP 8. So we can segment, segment the, the effort to run these uh, code changes and have them gradually become PHP 8 compatible and then Drupal 10 compatible, and then have these steps uh, gradually in Contrib as well. So we talked about how the upgrade process was, was easier, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, going from, I mean, you you described the process from going to uh, from eight eight nine to nine um, wonderfully, um, but uh, my question is more um, in the less complex upgrade process um, for Drupal eight and beyond. So, like this process is going to continue to Drupal nine, Drupal ten, so on and so forth. Um, is that having a positive, or do you think it's having a positive impact on uh, adoption of the of the system? I hope so. I don't have the numbers to prove. Uh, the Unfortunately, the usage numbers that we have, they don't correlate to sites. So we don't know if, so the, the not usage numbers don't correlate to sites. So we don't know if the Drupal 9 site that showed up is an update of a Drupal 8 site or if it's a new Drupal 9 site. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't really have the, the possibility to track uh, as sites as they move uh, up version. Uh, but the, one of the goals with making this happen, uh, a part of, uh, I mean, the major goal of making this happen was for our users to have much less pain as they had from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 or 9, which is a huge lift. It's a big uh, upgrade. There's a lot of work there. They need to migrate all of their data and rebuild their site. And that's a lot of pain and we don't want to do that ever again, hopefully. And so one of the goals was to make this much easier and make the major version transition more of a technical question. Because as I said, we built all of the new APIs and the new features into the previous major version. So you already have all of the new APIs and all of the shiny new features in the previous major version. So updating to the new major version doesn't actually get you any new shiny things. It just gets you a cleaned up version of what you already had. and it gets you continued uh, security and bug fix support, which is what's what's uh, going live now, right? As Drupal 8 goes end of life, now uh, Drupal 9 uh, provides that going forward. So um, the tr making this transition more of a technical question rather than needing to rebuild the whole thing, uh, but, but just running out of these few tools and making these code changes, I think uh, we proved that it that we can do a much easier upgrade process. And now that we did this uh, once, we are improving that further for Drupal 9 to 10, and we'll hopefully make it easier each time going forward. So um, I hope that this proves that, that uh, Drupal is gonna be easier to keep up and, um, and use. Nice. So what do you expect will be different with Drupal 7 end of life? Yeah, that's definitely going to be different. Um, so as I said, the move from Drupal 7 to Drupal 9, or at that point, actually Drupal 10, because hopefully by the time Drupal 7 end of life arrives, uh, Drupal 10 will be available as well, um, is a big migration path. So you need to rebuild your site. You need to move your data over. You need to look at whether even the same modules are available. You need to uh, consider how you rebuild your site in, a, in this new uh, system that uh, is Drupal 9 slash 10. So I think that's definitely going to be different. Um, 
Yeah, um, there's, there's, um, we have the tools in place in core to make all of those things happen. I think there's still a lot to do to make that transition easier in the future as well for everyone. So one big difference too, I think is going to be Drupal 8. So Drupal 6, when it was end of life, got a, a long-term support um, package that you could buy into if you needed to. Um, and Drupal 8 isn't doing that because the, the main reason why it's end of life is because Symphony is no longer supporting that version. Um, is, are there plans for Drupal 7 to have a long-term support plan as well? Yeah, that's a good point. So uh, Drupal 7, uh, there is a plan to have a long-term support program. It's called Vendor Extended Support. Um, I think it's uh, the Drupal.org slash project slash Drupal 7 ES, I believe. Okay. Um, and that basically involves various vendors um, that signed up to this program and the promise in the program is that there's gonna be, uh, I think three years of additional security support. Okay. So uh, you sign up for the program that, that requires you to basically contract with one of the vendors and then they will provide additional support from 2022 November up until 2025 November for Drupal 7. So um, yeah, so that, that right. gives you an additional window of time. Okay, so looking forward a little bit, what, what projects are you currently involved in that you're most excited about? Well, I am involved in uh, a lot of these things. Uh, I'm, I'm heavily involved in building upgrade status, which has been uh, key in, um, in making this happen. I'm also one of the coordinators for Drupal 10 itself really excited for all of the visual changes that are hopefully coming in Drupal 10 so to make uh, Claro okay. the new admin theme, to make Olivero the new front end theme. I think Drupal is, Drupal deserves to have the new modern looks that these themes provide and to, um, and to have the older looks that are not giving Drupal justice uh, to be retired. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited about those things. Um, as uh, you said in the intro, I'm also involved in uh, event organization. So I'm uh, part of the Drupal Europe, um, uh, Drupal Con Europe advisory group. And we just had Drupal Con Europe a month ago and we hope to have Drupal Con Europe in person next year. So I'm really excited to return to in-person events as well, as much as you do. And we, are, we have a lot of discussions about how to do that best whether to mix yeah. it up with uh, virtual, whether to have it full in person and how to accommodate everyone as best as possible. So do you have a particular contribution that you're most proud of? Oh, in my history of Drupal, I guess the, the multilingual initiative was, uh, was, the, was I think the most fun that I had maybe uh, in Drupal. So the, basically the multilingual initiative was a big grassroots initiative with thousands of contributors. And it really had a big presence everywhere, wherever we did something. And uh, it resulted in one of the biggest selling points, I think of Drupal 8. When you come from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, uh, the Drupal 8 um, has, has a wide ranging, totally multilingual system where you can translate whatever you want in configuration, in content, in the back end, in the front end. Uh, and that was really the result of thousands of people contributing. And I really enjoyed all the things where we were, how we led the initiative, how we did research, how we did workshops, how we did user research, how we did design, how we did um, different development efforts, how we did ABC versions of different solutions for things how we presented these at conferences. We've had a like a candid presentation deck that people could present okay. at their events. We've had a recording of it. We've been translated to multiple languages. So I think it was a lot of fun and a lot of interesting um, experience in how you can do open source in different ways and not just as a code contributor. I, I, I have to echo what you said. I think the multilingual support, even though every site doesn't use it, is 
if it needs it, that's a major, major selling point of Drupal 8. I mean, it doesn't solve every problem. Multilingual is complex and takes a lot of thought to do right, but every hard problem I feel like that could be solved out of the box is solved out of the box. And the system um, from, from seven to eight was so, so vastly improved yeah. that like, you know, building, building a site in yeah. one platform was not the same as building a multilingual site in the other platform. And, you know, eight's so much better. And I, I look forward to that system growing in, in nine and 10 and improving. Yeah. Yeah, it was really thanks to the thousands of contributors that were involved and, and made it happen. So uh, coming into the end of the show here, and obviously you are a super busy guy. Um, now that now that Drupal 8 is end of life, it's not like you're like, oh, I'm done. Okay, I'm just going to watch from the sideline, right? You're, you're involved in Drupal 9, you're involved in uh, Drupal 10. But what do you think, you know, the next big thing is for you? Yeah, I hope to continue make this process even easier for Drupal 10. So we are trying to figure out tooling and and uh, and all and and documentation and session materials and all of these things, and apply it to how we can make this process even easier from nine to ten, uh, because uh, uh, because it's coming soon. It's coming next year. I'm really excited to work on that now. It's, it's not often that we have somebody that's main, been a core committer for so long on the show. So I want to take advantage of that. And I, I have a few questions, like just in general, because you were a release manager for Drupal 6, right? Yep. Which was, which end of life five years ago, 2016, right? The, yeah, I don't know. The community and, case, and, yes. And would have been released, I think, in 2008 or 2007, right? So I'm curious, what's the biggest change in managing core over the time that you've been doing that for Drupal? I mean, for Drupal 6, there was a couple of core committers and, this, and the whole code base, which was much smaller and much more manageable. So a couple of us could look at patches and then understand that they work and if they don't work. And the same doesn't apply anymore to, to, uh, to Drupal 8 slash 9 slash 10. The complexity um, is definitely much bigger. We have a much bigger team of core committers now. We specialize in different areas. So I'm a, I'm a, core, a core initiative coordinator coordinator. So I'm a meta coordinator mm -hmm. that I go in and I help the other coordinators and unblock them and go into initiatives and sometimes replace or fill in for the initiative lead when I need to. Um, I organize meetings where we come together and try to unblock each other's uh, problems as we can, uh, stuff like that. But we have uh, product managers that focus on the, what kind of features and how the cohesive products of Drupal is gonna look like. We have framework managers that look like, look on uh, how the APIs should work and whether whether it should be implemented this way or that way or with a different component. We have front-end framework managers that look at the same thing on the front end. Uh, we have committer facilitators that help run meetings and, and post uh, release announcements. So we have a lot of different roles, even in the core committer team uh, that are not, not even always committing, but more like uh, architecture management and overview and, and, um, and support and that kind of thing. So definitely requires a lot more people um, to do. Just got a, a couple more questions here. Um, sorry, going a little off script, but um, you mentioned that you're the initiative lead coordinator or initiative coordinator coordinator. Yeah. Um, I, I'm wondering how, how close to that works. So for example, easy out of the box is one of the initiatives. Um, mm -hmm. but that's built up of multiple initiatives as well. So we had Chris on, um, a couple months ago to talk about the project uh, browser, project browser initiative. So are you, um, kind of making sure that uh, each of those people are communicating with each other as well as internally, or are you helping them block them? Like what does that day to day kind of look like, or is it much, much higher level of making sure that the easy out of the box initiative is covering you know, all the areas it needs to cover. 
It's uh, I mean, there's some proactive parts and there's also some on a needs basis. So for example, I, I was on uh, the project browser initiative meetings for the uh, first few months, uh, trying to help okay. kick it off and, and uh, set a balance. And then when it seemed like they, they identified their leads that they want to work with and it was off to the races, then I was off and I moved on to other things. Uh, for Olivero, for example, I regularly jump into the meetings and I ask how I can help and I go in the, the critical focus issues that they are working on right now and try to help either find a reviewer or commit them or, or, or uh, figure out if like, there is a product review that's needed, then I can provide it. Um, so that kind of thing. Um, I'm also on the UX meetings where it's really random. Like sometimes an initiative team comes in from like automated updates and they show their, their designs of how this should look like and then re re review and provide feedback. And we can, uh, when the product manager is there, a Drupal core product manager, we can directly provide uh, feedback there as well as a product manager, but also the UX team itself provides a lot of valuable feedback there too. So, so I'm personally at some of these places and when I'm not, then I'm, I also help connect the dots and direct certain people to issues and try to find the right reviewers. Uh, so since I have this very lengthy history in the Drupal community, I started in 2003, September something. Yeah. Um, so I have like 18 years of, of uh, Drupal experience. So I know like who to talk to and who's who has experience in this or that, and I can help make these connections um, easier. And so how is the merge request support with GitLab affected your experience as a core committer? Ah, nice. Yeah, so I think uh, the uh, I think the merge request support on Drupal.org uh, helped with a lot of a uh, lot of changes that were people were working on off Drupal.org or they didn't want to be even involved in Drupal core anymore because we were this arcane patching people that need to file these patches. Um, so I think that helped a lot. Um, the uh, ask a core committer committing them or merging the merge request, we still don't have a, a pinned down clear solution for how to do that. There are some technical limitations. So we're still committing uh, from the patches of merge requests. But I think the collaboration and merge request is really useful. I'm involved in various merge requests and, and it's been great. Uh, I really like the Drupal pod tool that was built on top of merge requests uh, and, and patches as well. So I'm, I'm personally using Drupal pod as well for, uh, for working on various core issues and contrib issues, because one of the struggles of a core committer is that you you need to uh, install and set up and potentially test a lot of different patches all the time, and having a setup that that has all of those different tools. As for some of them, you need to have different composer dependencies. For some of them, you need to have different projects installed, etc. So there's a, a lot of pain involved in that. But now that you have this possibility to have an ephemeral environment that you yeah. can just pull up, run in the cloud, it's pretty fast. Um, you can pull up a patch and work on it and debug it in uh, Drupal pod and then uh, be sure that it's fine and then commit it. Uh, I think it's been really uh, game changing recently. So I really like all of these experimentations on top of um, the GitLab merge requests. And yeah, for those of you, with... those of you uh, listeners that don't know what Drupal pod is, you can go back to listen to uh, talking Drupal 312, where we, we talk about that in in its entirety yeah that's amazing i i am curious though what because you do obviously have to have a local environment too for some things when you're working on them what what do you use locally when you're working on drupal um i don't really use the local environment much so i'm uh, mostly moved over to drupal pod now oh wow. but i've had like a i've had a native php set up on mac os i don't have a special docker magic thing hmm. so that's probably Part of why I struggle with having all kinds of different dependencies change under me, because I don't have like various of my Docker containers lying around that I would pull in for these things. Um, but yeah. I, I, I... Wait, la last question before we close out the show, unless John or April has another, but 
Oh, I, I wouldn't want to interrupt. As as a module maintainer or somebody working on a core patch or something, what's the best thing we can do to make your job easier if you're reviewing the patch? Yeah, so as a patch writer for core or contrib, I think the best idea is to explain the problem well, explain the solution well, how did you come to the solution? Ideally, you don't post the big big uh, patch or, or merge request uh, as one big code change. But we can see some of the thinking process behind how you arrived at it by, by a series of comments or a series of commits on the merge request. It really helps to understand like, what did you try? Why did you arrive at this uh, solution? And then if, there, if there's a UI change, there's always screenshots or GIFs or, or, or MPEG files or whatever works that shows how this looks like, that makes it much easier to find where it changed on the UI, how it changed, and to be able to uh, assess that as well. So basically documenting all documenting the problem and the fix and how, how you arrived at how you arrived there is I think the most important because that helps with understanding the whole thing. If it's a big change and it's hard to see like why do you need to change this place and that API and here and that's very hard to hard to uh, wrap your head around it unless uh, you can see the process the process as well. Well, Gabor, thank you for joining us. It's been fascinating. Uh, before we close out, is there anything you'd like to let our listeners know? Well, if you are in Drupal eight, then <laughs> start Stand start update. using start using upgrade status and uh, Drupal Rector, and think about your updates now. If you have questions or feedback, reach out to Talking Drupal on Twitter with the handle Talking Drupal or via email at show at talkingdrupal.com. You can connect with our hosts and other listeners on Drupal Slack in the Talking Drupal channel. If you're interested in show news, upcoming Drupal camps, local meetups, and Chad's book corner, sign up for our newsletter at talkingdrupal.com slash newsletter. And you can always promote your Drupal camp on Talking Drupal. You can learn more at talkingdrupal.com slash camp promo. And if you wanted to use that for DrupalCon Europe, you could do that as well. Thank you, patrons, for supporting Talking Drupal. Your support is greatly appreciated. You can learn more about becoming a patron at talkingdrupal.com and choosing the Become a Patron button in the sidebar. And Gabber, if our listeners wanted to get in touch with you, had a question, comment, just want to thank you, uh, what would be the best way for them to get in touch with you? The best way is probably on Twitter. I'm at Gabor Hoichi uh, on Twitter. You can find me there. Perfect. And April, how about you? Uh, same Twitter at uh, week before next. And John? Uh, you can find out about me uh, on all the social networks at John Picozzi, uh, or at my website, Picozzi.com. And you can find out about EPAM at EPAM.com. And I'm pretty much everywhere at Nixman, N-I-C-X-V-A-N, and usually on the Drupal Slack and talking Drupal if you want to chat with me. And if you've enjoyed listening, we've enjoyed talking. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>